here to share some thoughts on, well, is this is this the Republican Party today? I've asked Reed Galen to come talk with us. Reed is uh, co-founder of the Lincoln Project. Reed, thanks for taking time for us. Thanks for having me back. So I'm looking at this comment, and I've, I've been I've been thinking about this most of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, because this was, in my view, if you'd asked me a year ago what my what my thoughts of the future is, this is this was going to be it. Uh, they were eventually going to take ownership of it because this is what Republicans do very well. They never apologize, they never back up, and they always, if they were wrong, they were they were double right wrong. No, you, listen, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that um, Republic. Listen, even when I was a Republican, um, you know any sort of sort of apology was, you know, with the exception of something truly egregious, you didn't apologize. You just drove on. Right. Um, now, what I think you see is that they they relish this stuff. Right. They relish the transgressive behavior and language. And I think also, Rick, they tell you what they're going to do. Like Green and Gates, they believe in this stuff. Uh, a lot of Republican candidates believe in this stuff. Is this the Republican Party of today? It is. When 68 percent of self-identified Republican voters believe that Donald Trump had the election stolen from him and therefore Joe Biden is an illegitimate president, that is the position of the Republican Party. So, uh, so you, you said a second ago, you, it's one of the reasons you left the party, you were, you were a former Republican and a, a, a Republican right. operative, pretty, really high up there. How did the party get away from you? How did you guys get to this point? I mean, and, you know, I have my views, uh, but I'm curious from your perspective, you know, how did, how did you get here? You know, it's a good question, and I don't know that it only has one answer. Um, I think that there was a confluence of things. One is that I think um, uh, the, the two parties started moving apart ideologically um, and geographically, frankly, um, and, and demographically. Um, uh, the Republican voters became increasingly white uh, with this weird spread between the working class and the ultra wealthy. Um, and, and, you know, the, 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 the democratic party moved out to the coasts, uh, became, became far more diverse. Um, the difference of course, is that the Republican party had always had a pretty nasty race, you know, racial tinge to it. Um, that burst out into the open. If you think back to, t uh, R Mitt Romney being the Republican nominee in 2012, um, that was the end of it. Um, and I think also you think back even to 2000, two, excuse me, that was 2012, 2010, the tea party. We saw what was coming, but none of us, we all thought, oh, these are the people who we've always said, you know what, like, we hear you, we know you're here, you're sort of noisy, but you got no place else to go, right? right. We didn't understand that they would capture the party. Yeah, the Buchanan um, wing, if you will, because I remember back in the, you know, Molly Ivins, the- uh, Sure. She's passed- I was long, there at that passed. speech. I was on the floor of the, I was on the floor of the Astrodome for that speech. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that, you know, uh, this is who they are. in the original German. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the thing is that there, I mean, again, just, I mean, both political parties have always had their noisy activist wing. That was just what it was. Right. Um, but the activists, the noisy activists tended to get just enough to keep them happy. Um, and, and they stayed in line. I think we're seeing, we've already seen with the Republican party that the activists, the, you know, the, the inmates eventually overtook the asylum. And I think you see now amongst the Democrats that the progressive wing is, is unwilling to sit quietly um, for the things they believe in. I don't think it'll turn out the way it did for the Republican Party, admittedly. But um, yeah, I think that it just, you know, we took a lot of things for granted. I think that it became, you know, the party of big business and, you know, tax cuts uh, tried to pawn people off with, you know, judges and those sorts of things. And ultimately, the, the party was hollowed out ideologically because it became about power and money and nothing else. Is there any way uh, ironically back? enough, it's still just power and money. Yeah, is there any way back to, uh, do you see them coming between the curbs at some point for, or is, you know, all of the, uh, the punditry saying, oh, we're headed for violence in the streets. There's going to be a civil war. There's all of that talk of chaos. It, it, do you, do you think that's where we're headed? I don't know yet. Um, how does it come back? Uh, the, well, the Republican party, uh, will have to be burnt down and reformed. Um, as it currently stands, it is an anti-democratic authoritarian movement uh, led by very, very bad people who have very, very bad intentions, which, I, as I noted earlier, they absolutely share with every one of us. They have to lose electorally badly in 2022, 2024, and probably 26 and 28 until finally somebody's going to say, I'd rather win 
then, you know, have Democrats take over everything. But isn't that um, where they course, are now? This... I mean, you talk to the average Republican voter, and, mm -hmm. and I know a lot of them because I'm in a very Republican area. Uh, sure. They may not like what Trump has done. They may be a little un, you know, uncomfortable with, you know, with the riot, with the insurrection. They may, you know, not want policemen killed, and they may I don't want to see that kind of stuff. But they're still going to vote for the Republican because, well, the Democrats are evil incarnate, uh, and that's that... been that's been a great, um, you know, a great line for right wing media who, honestly and truthfully, they dominate talk radio. They dominate cable news. Uh, you know, they're the message machine that is, has created this monster. Uh, well, listen, I, I, uh, I, I completely agree with you. The, the right wing radical rage machine, for lack of a better way to put it, drives the political narrative in this country today. Um, you can say that, oh, there's CNN and there's MSNBC and the New York Times. But the truth is, is that whatever Tucker Carlson wants to talk about, is probably going to get picked up by major what we we used to think of as mainstream media outlets. They'll cover it straight. There's this weird and really unfortunate, you know, dual equivalency that somehow just because you know you quoted a Democrat, you must you know you must quote a Republican, even if you know the Republican's just going to lie to your face or make something up. Uh, it's it's a dangerous thing. Um, and and what you said earlier with like uh, someone like Gates, they can say anything and they can lie about everything because they don't care. Right. All they care about is winning. All they care about is ensuring that their people are as fired up as they can. Do I think that violence is upon us? I think we will see violence. I don't think we're going to know where or when um, there is a there is a, you know, a whole bunch of kindling in the form of 20 or 30 million Americans who believe that, you know, they truly believe in in the sort of worst Trumpist Steve Bannon stuff. And, you know, all they need is a spark. Yeah. Um, but I'm hoping we get through this year and I'm hoping we get through every year without that. Yeah, because I look at some of the, you know, I think of uh, the Richmond uh, back when Trump was president, there was that rally at the Richmond. They called it a rally for the, the, the Second Amendment. Uh, but you saw all those people showing up with their guns. And uh, to me, it seemed like a military operation uh, and more of a scare attack to saying, look what we can look what we can muster up. Uh, you, sure. you, you literally cannot stop us. Uh, and then, of course, what we saw on January 6th, uh, for me, I said that thing in Richmond was just the precursor to what could have happened on January 6th. No, I think you're right. I mean, it, when when and I mean, I think we should also understand, too, that, you know, Trump didn't just overtake the Republican Party and make it his own. He also created an umbrella movement of very unsavory characters, you know, militia types, those sorts of folks who never had a place anywhere in mainstream politics and in thankfully for it, or even really mainstream society. He gave those people a home in, within his orbit, within the Republican party. And now they stand on street corners with AR 15s. Some of them utilize those AR 15s as we saw in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, and they absolutely do it on purpose. They absolutely do it to menace people to say, yes, we will employ violence if necessary. Uh, we saw that one of those turning point USA things that that Charlie Kirk guy put on, well, guy asked a question, when are we gonna when are we gonna stop putting up with this and we're gonna when are we gonna start killing people yeah and that's not just there it's, that's that's come out a number of times when are we go when are we get in the guns and look i know people like that i know people who they've got guns and, and rice buried all over central pennsylvania they've told me because they're ready for the next the next civil war because they think that they're going to i don't know change the outcome of the original one uh, which is twisted, but you know, there are people who, you know, they seem to want this kind of chaos, and and I gotta understand why. Is it because their lives didn't turn out as as they were told they could have been? They were going to be, you know, chieftains of industry and and captains or this or that, and they turned out to be the guy who go goes, you want fries with that? I don't know, but that kind of anger uh, seems steeped in something, and and I'm I'm trying to put my hands on exactly what it is. I, I mean, I think part of it, yeah, is is this idea of, I mean, especially in the middle of the country, right, uh, amongst the guys you're talking about, uh, you know, I think that they probably feel uh, culturally put down. I think they probably feel like that the elitists on the coasts make fun of them, which they probably do, to be honest with you. Um, and there's a resentment to that. Um, does that mean that they somehow didn't get the life they wanted? No, but I think that, and, and again, you would you probably know these guys better than I do. I think they they have been made to feel or have been allowed to feel like because of where they're from or what it is they do, that you know there's not enough inherent value in who they are as a person. 
uh, which of course lets someone like a Donald Trump really fire those people up. It's this loss of like, I was in charge and now I'm not, a way of life, they're coming, right? This is all very normal language for ideologues who are yeah. trying to pit one you know, group over another. We saw that in Yugoslavia 30 years ago, where you know the Serbs are saying, look at all these people coming in, they're changing our way of life, you know, it's our country, how come they come in? You know, they, 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 and what happens is, and I think, you know, Rick, on the, on the violence front, it's very dangerous because what happens is an individual becomes not a subject, an individual, but they become an object, them, they, it, they're the enemy. And I think that's where it gets pretty dangerous. No, and that that is the fear, and you're absolutely right on that. You listen to the Rick Smith Show here with Reed Galen. Reed's the co-founder of the Lincoln Project. You can follow them on Twitter at Project Lincoln. Uh, you know, I, I look at this moment, and and I I really am trying uh, to reach some some of my Republican friends uh, because mm-hmm. I think in order to do what you've said has to happen, uh, the Republican Party has to find themselves, and maybe that's a couple elections elections down the line. It's it's still the voters. It's still the people who are still pulling those levers. And right. if they're being constantly bombarded with the kind of other talk, they, they're the problem that we see on Fox News, that we see in, in talk radio. All I heard today on talk radio was uh, Antifa, uh, the George Floyd r- uh, protest. That, that's where they focus their attention. And as long as the red meat, you know, the outrage candy, what I call it, is being fed to these people, I don't know that this, this taps down. No, I think you're right. Again, and all of that is is deflection and projection, right? It wasn't us, it was them. Uh, you know, let's not talk about an insurrection at the Capitol. Let's talk about, and when they say, you know, the BLM protest, what they're saying is black people burning, burning buildings down in cities, right? right? That's what, I mean, it's, they're not even using coded language anymore, right? right? They right. Just, there's this, this sort of thing. It's like, oh, they keep saying the quiet part out loud. No, They're saying it all out loud. There's no quiet part anymore. They're willing to say anything. And look, Rick, there's been no sanction for them legally, politically, socially, none of it. Right. Financially, they no no one other than the seven or eight hundred people who stormed the Capitol have been held to account in any way for this. And, you know, unless somebody gets off the schneid in a hurry, a lot of people probably won't ever deal with, you know, suffer for it. I mean, it's all well and good to have a congressional committee saying, you know, here's this thing that you did. But as last time I checked, it's the, you know, it's the executive branch that prosecutes people federally. It's not, it's not Congress. And so, you know, I I mean, I I hope that, you know, Attorney General Garland means it when they're going to take something seriously. I hope that, you know, President Biden give a very forceful, I thought, necessary speech at the Capitol today. I hope he means it. Uh, but there's got to be consequences. Um, you know, there's the, that famous trope, right? A coup unpunished is practice, and we can't let them practice again. No, you're absolutely right. And so I, 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 let me get your thoughts on today's speech. I thought it was probably the best speech of his presidency. I'm generally uh, not somebody, if I were one of his handlers, not putting him out for a 25-minute speech. Uh, but I thought he did really well today, and I thought the, the words were powerful, and I thought he delivered it well. I, I think so, and I, th- I think he needed, I mean... Uh, it was the speech he needed to give. Um, and I think it was the, the the speech he needed to give, not only for the country writ large, but frankly for his party. Um, because as you know, um, Democrats want to win. They want to feel good about how they win. Uh, they want to be thought of as the good guys and the white hats. Uh, but as you know, Rick, in a fight, um, if you stand there with your hands by your side while the other guy punches you in the stomach in the face, you're going to lose most of the time. Yeah, well, my, um, my comment on, on Democrats has always been when a fight breaks out, they'll be the ones to hold your coat. Um, <laughs> and and I'm, and I'm hoping this, to, to your point, I'm hoping this was that moment where they throw your coat on the ground and they go, they, they join in. Right. Well, listen, we don't, we don't hold many people's coats, and I don't believe that you do either. Um, but I'll say this is I think that, where, the, 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 the pulse you have on those folks in places like central Pennsylvania, I think is hugely important. I think there are votes for Democratic candidates in those areas. I really do. And this Um, is where we'll probably disagree on things. I think the issues are are as important as the rhetoric. Uh, You know, as as a union guy, as a a working class guy, I think uh, Democrats have to find their roots in those worlds uh, and, and promote good sound labor law reform. Uh, make people's lives better. Be the party of the working class, uh, the no, FDR era, and and we may disagree on that. But I think no, that's no, where no. They listen, go. I mean, I'll say this. I was, I mean, I spent ten years in California, so every union you can think of kicked the you know what out of me one time or another, right? 
Um, but I would say you're absolutely right. When it comes to um, when it comes to the building trades, when it comes to the Teamsters, when it comes to the private sector unions, I 100% agree. I mean, I think you see, um, I was talking to somebody about this today, the idea that you've got a guy like Jeff Bezos who only worries about like going on rich people's yachts and shooting rockets into space when he's got a, you know, a, a facility collapse in the, in the midst of a tornado and he can't even be troubled to say something about it. I think we've clearly crossed some sort of Rubicon when it comes to how we deal with you know, employees who are working their tails off, who aren't able to go to the bathroom. Like this is not, this is not like, this is not the early 1900s, right? Like with a triangle shirt company, like that's, you know, that is that what it's going to take? We're going to have to lose 700 people in some awful fire before we sort of wake up and say, we can't treat human beings like that. Um, and so I, I think that you're absolutely right. And I think that Democrats shouldn't be timid about stuff like that. Um, because I think, I think that the white working class has moved away culturally part of it, but also because they saw unions disappearing and not one, not a lot of people fighting for them. Yeah. Uh, and look, I've said this as the Democrats were, were Republican light. Uh, that's when things started to split us, uh, split into, into, into parts. Uh, and I think they need to get that back. And look, I would love if there were pro-union Republicans again. I'm old enough to remember where there were some. Uh, I would like to see that back again and, and some soul back to the party. But, Reed, I appreciate you taking some time for us. Uh, appreciate your thoughts, as always. Good stuff. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. Uh, anytime. Reed Galen, co-founder of the Lincoln Project.